Dow plays the game. Holodeck program Andoria 4 is up and running. Classic. And Rock Talk thinks Murph is indestructible. She might be right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton and Bonnie Hello. Gordon, of course. Hello. We are joined by a very, very special guest. Actually, what am I thinking? Bonnie, would you like to introduce uh, Aaron? I would. I really would. Um, <laughs> everyone, listeners, viewers, uh, people of the Trek universe, I would love for you all to give a warm welcome to Aaron Weltke, the writer of this most recent episode of Star Trek Prodigy. Hi. Thank you for having me. Air um, horn, so. air horn noise. Please. Confetti ball. Thank you, tone horn. Red alert. Shirt cannon. <laughs> Shirt cannon. Uh, thank so you for cool. having me. It's it, this has been quite a day. You know, the episode just dropped uh, out literally hours ago. So mm -hmm. uh, you know, my notifications are exploding right now. <laughs> so I I appreciate uh, you having me on. I'm I, like uh, I think I said last time I was here. I love talking about Star Trek uh, with whoever will listen. And obviously, <laughs> this this episode means a lot to me, and I think a lot of other people too. So uh, happy to be here. Uh, Aaron, I think I speak for nerds everywhere when I say thank you very much for joining in. And speaking of which, you really let your nerd flag fly in this episode, which is uh, episode six of season one, entitled Kobayashi, directed by Alan Wan, written by Aaron J. Waltke, by the way. Uh, man, oh man. Okay, so Sirach, I don't know where you want to start, but I just want to address the elephant in the room which is how much freaking time did it take for you <laughs> to parse through? Because this, this was clearly audio that was taken from other episodes. I think I even heard a, a movie quote. I think there was a line from Spock, possibly from the, the JJ movies, if I remember correctly. There was one line where he said, uh, I remember another captain of the enterprise or something like that. I feel like that was from one of the movies. That, I think that one was from Unification too. Um, mm, okay. but, but, uh, he does, but him saying live long and prosper was from JJ 2009. Wow. And then him, him, I think there was a couple of lines, uh, from Uhura and, uh, I think the captain of the Kobayashi Maru from Wrath of Khan, uh, and then mm -hmm. the rest were taken from a smattering of different, uh, Star Trek episodes from across the last 55 years. <laughs> and so uh, how many, oh six plus shows, seven, five and, oh. and, and, and movies, um, I mean, to say it was a Herculean task is probably an understatement, you know, <laughs> it was, but it was a labor of love, no question. Um, you know, it was something that I kind of self-assigned, uh, you know, I, I start, I did it originally when we were first breaking the episode and just trying to figure out what was possible and, you know, how we were going to approach this, you know, that we talked about all options. We're like, well, do we get sound alikes? Do we see who is available? And then ultimately we were like, no, if we're going to do the characters, let's, let's honor the original performances and the original characters. And they said, well, how are we going to do that? And I was like, well, we have hundreds of hours of, of footage uh, uh, of them doing it. Like, let's just see if it's possible mm -hmm. because I, I, you know, to get philosophical for a second, I honestly think that Star Trek has become such a legacy and such a franchise that it, it is now just a conversation across uh, decades and generations. And the I think from a, an artistic and personal standpoint, I thought it was not only a, a, a challenge, but uh, an important one to say, if you can do this, if you can actually preserve what the these original artists intended when they were bringing these characters to life you know that would probably be the best way to honor them than just to create a uh you know find a sound alike and and have it just like be a fun nod and so i it took me a very long time <laughs> you know I, I, all told i think i went back into the archives probably eight or nine times i watched about 40-ish episodes top to bottom rewatched them uh, read about 90 Star Trek scripts, top to bottom, um, wow. just trying to find the perfect lines. And it wasn't just a matter of just reading them and say, oh, that's good, that's good. Sometimes I'd find lines that I thought were perfect, and then I would go back in uh, and find them in the episode and realize that the inflection was wrong or, or it was recorded in the 1960s, so they were too far away from the microphone 
or they were like rattling something while they were talking mm-hmm. or they were, ch- or they were shuffling, you know, the microphones back then weren't the best. Um, and you know, they, I think there's the audio is still a little rough in spots, but I think we were able to salvage it in such a way. And the fact that it's through a simulation right. that you're willing to go along with it and, and mm-hmm. embrace it for what it is, which is a celebration of these artists' performances. Um, a, a, a kind of communing in a, a, sort of the sacred space of the Star Trek Enterprise bridge. Aaron, you and if I were, have a team. Sorry, I just, I just <laughs> assumed you said, all right, you two find me some lines that are kind of like this, and you two find me some like. <laughs> it was all me. Yeah, I, 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 I'm a bit masochistic that way, I suppose. But it really didn't feel like work. It was, it was a, a calling, and I, I don't mean to sound dramatic, but it was sort of like, if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right, uh, or do it as best as I possibly can. Um, and you know, people sometimes assume that. Oh, you're working on a, a television show. You must have massive resources and whole departments that will handle that. And, mm-hmm. you know, maybe some of the bigger shows do. But, you know, uh, Star Trek Prodigy is very much like, you know, we, we're a tight knit crew or like a pirate crew that's just trying to to take it, uh, the, the moment we've been given and the, the, what resources we have and cobble it together and try to create a cathedral, even if it's made out of matchsticks or something. Uh, it's a little bit like a theater company that way. It just has to look, the, the end result has to look like you put, uh, that, like you had, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to put into it. It wasn't just me staying up and drinking coffee at three in the morning, uh, keeping my wife awake, watching uh, Balance of Terror for the 10th time to find the perfect <laughs> line uh, where they talk about the neutral zone. Um, but yeah, it was, it, it was, it, it, I, 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 I do have to give credit though, to the Star Trek archives too, because, you know, I found the lines, but then they had to go into the actual physical media or the digitized media and, and pull those lines then for me, send it. Then I would give that to the team, say, put this here, shift it this way, that way. And it was, it was a, a team effort of <laughs> a lot of buccaneers just trying to figure out how we could do something that I don't think had really been done before on this level. The closest I can think of, which was sort of an inspiration of like, oh, maybe we can pull it off, was from Deep Space Nine. In, oh, in it's the, one of my favorite episodes. Uh, yes. Files and yeah. Tribulations. And I was mm-hmm. like, well, if they can pull it off. Uh, then maybe, maybe just maybe, if I if I put enough heart and gumption into this, we can do it too. So, and if I remember correctly, Aaron, uh, when recording this, we uh, the team wasn't sure which characters they were going to be able to get, or uh, or uh, if they were going to be able to add more. And uh, as the computer, I got to read so many different Star Trek characters. Um, you know. <laughs> Like in the episode now, you hear me saying, you know, communications officer, Ahura, and, you know, going down the list. But I got to say so many other characters that weren't listed uh, in the episode. And when I say I actively squealed after every name, because, you know, I would just turn the page and go, what? I was just so excited. Um, So, you know, just while I have your attention, uh, personally, I want to thank you because you know, as a Trekkie and being able to work on the show is already a dream. And I know I'll never, you know, in reality, get to work with people like Leonard Nimoy and, you know, mm. you know, Spock is one of my favorite characters. And of course, Scotty and, you know, these are, these are, uh, and, and Odo, you know, these are characters that I, I love and have grown up with and, and, and wish I could share a scene with them. And you actually made it a reality. Like I got to be in a scene you know, with Spock and Odo and Scotty and and Uhura. And it just blows my mind that these legends of Star Trek that, you know, I'll never really get to work with uh, are, I get to say their names and and be in in a scene with them. So thank you for that. Like, I don't want to get emotional and cry about it, but it's- Well, you're making it a little bit. (laughs) It's it's, it's overwhelming. It's nice to hear that because, you know, as I've kind of alluded to, a big reason why I wanted to do it this way was because I wanted it. it, I'll put it this way. My hope of of all hopes is like one of the mandates of Prodigy is to introduce new and young Mm -hmm. audiences to Star Trek. And my Mm -hmm. hope is like by just presenting a little space in which you could see some of these performances just for in a very limited minor way. 
that it will it'll create that spark of interest and be part of that gateway that's going to go back and see all the incredible things that mm. Renee and Leonard and James and everyone has done mm. over the past 55 years because it's it's been the joy of my life to have these characters kind of you know uh, that I can re return to uh, on by watching TV or at this point just playing the scenes in my head um, mm. and. I, I'm, I'm, I, it always makes me happy, uh, and especially today as people responding to it are feel, feeling a similar sentiment. So, I'm, I'm glad that's coming across. Yeah, so. it was, it was amazing. And again, I have been sitting on my love for this episode for over a year. <laughs> um, in fact, fun fact, uh, I think after I recorded it, I, I slid into your DMs and thanked you for the script. Uh, that was my first interaction with you on Twitter. I was like, you don't know me, but thank you. Uh, it was it was great. And so thank you so much. It was just, oh, uh, what a dream to just be able to say that I got to speak in the same scenes as some of these characters. Yeah. Well, they're all masters of their craft. And I'm, I'm just glad that I was able to be I don't know what a, a doorman for their performances, at least for mm. one little way that hopefully other people can discover the rest of the amazing things they've done. So, mm. all right, Sirac, Sirac. <laughs> every once there. in a while, every once in a while, when we watch a Deep Space Nine episode, I say, "God, I wish I could see Sirac's reaction." But today, <laughs> more than I think, when Eddington or Cal Hudson betrayed Cisco, more than uh, you know, when Wayun dies the first time. I felt like I wish I could have seen your reaction when we saw Odo mm. pop in and Aaron obviously knows Star Trek because everybody knows the best way to introduce Odo is to have him go. Oh. <laughs> right? How did you react or how do you feel about it? Well, you know, first of all, it took me about an hour to watch this episode yes. even though it's about 24 minutes long 22 minutes long i had to keep stopping it and rewinding it and writing things down because it was just full of stuff um there was just it was packed i mean the b storyline was uh, you know could have been the, an a storyline in <laughs> itself yeah. yeah so um but i want to say congratulations to you aaron because i i want to say that um i rate this episode as an a plus and I also say that, you know, I wrote down here in my notes, this is the best new episode of Star Trek out of all the series that they've released. In my Whoa. humble opinion. Wow. In my You're going to make me cry, opinion. Ciroc. <laughs> Sorry. And, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. It's just, it was just the way I, I feel like Star Trek needs to be written. I feel like um, when you write it in this way and you have this tapestry of the old and the new and you have you use and maximize your ability to pull from the old and blend it into the new uh -huh. uh, <laughs> i just thought that you did a remarkable <laughs> job of making this story work and um yeah it was definitely the best uh of the new star trek um that's been released of all, all the series in my opinion I uh, watched it, you know, intensely. I thought of trials and tribulations. I thought of the kind of historical uh, moment that you captured here in this episode um, and bringing all the old characters and, and blending them in with the new storyline is, is really kind of this handing of the baton to this Dao character and, yeah. and, and the storyline of what they're doing here on Prodigy. So, I mean, congratulations to you. Um, I'm glad that this buildup has led to this moment. It's, it feels like it was well worth the wait. And there was a point at which you're like, where are they going to go with this story? And now I'm seeing that it's about to get really interesting. Um, even ends on a fantastic note that leaves you wanting more. And so all around from the beginning to the end, I think you captivated the audience um, you gave the Star Trek what they what they're looking for, and you wrote a kind of episode that's going to, um, for me, going to stand in the upper echelon of the lore of Star Trek um, throughout time. So, thanks, wow. Eric, for um, for doing this and and putting in the work, having the vision, executing the vision, 
And, you know, I, th- this is one of those episodes. I don't know if you see my notes, but yeah. I <laughs> have more space. Wow. I, I'm just writing and writing and writing. And, you know, <laughs> I was about to get onto page two. And, and, and I only write this much for an hour long episode of some really good material. Sometimes we write less than that in, a, yeah. in an hour show. But this one was yeah. just like, it was a scroll. Yeah. And I could have done more. I was holding back. <laughs> And just this fantastic job. I, I, that's when I, a mark of a good writer to me as well is when I find myself constantly writing and writing yeah. down lines, writing down scenes, writing down meanings. And that's what you did. You know, language is more than translation. It's interpretation. Love that line, mm-hmm. Aaron. I mean, yeah. it's just like a, it's, it's like a philosophy in itself. It makes you kind of think about language and how, you know, um, you know, how people read the Bible. I thought of this when I was watching mm-hmm. the episode, but I thought of the Bible and I saw all the words are in the Bible, but how it's interpreted by somebody really mm-hmm. means more than just the language of it. Mm-hmm. And um, so great point that you made in, in, in the dialogue, um, you know, expanded on, on Murph's character, love to <laughs> see more Murph. And, and you Everybody more loves Murph. Murph. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you gave me more Murph. Uh, <laughs> I, I just, I just can't say enough good things about this. And to me, this is just like a home run. And it's going to be, like I said, considered upon all, all of the Star Trek as one of the best episodes. Yes. Um, so congratulations for uh, that accomplishment, Aaron. Wow. You did it. I feel like the good whole episode. That. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I feel like the whole episode is like a love letter to Star yes. Trek. Like it basically... Um, for all the Trekkies watching and for people who are familiar with, you know, the lore and the franchise, it's, it is a love letter to, to everything that they grew up with and, and, and love about Star Trek. And it's also such a, like he was saying, such a great introduction for the younger audience to see who some of these legends are and just to kind of give them a sneak peek of what, what's to come if, if they go back and watch, you know, some of the original series and next generation. And, you know, it's such a, it, it just, it wraps it up so beautifully. Um, yeah. Well, what he I, said. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a little at a loss for words because that was uh, such a beautiful tribute. And as a Midwesterner, I have no idea how to take compliments, but <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. You know, I'm glad that the, that, the, that that sort of thing came across because it really was, as I said, it came from a place of, of deep love and it was a love letter you know, uh, because this was my first, this is something that's, I guess, been building up inside me from my, you know, because my first exposure to Star Trek was sitting on the couch watching the, 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 the premiere of Star Trek The Next Generation back in 1987, live with my dad. I was just like a young kid, but I was feeding off his energy. And I, there's something palpable about seeing this possible future, you know, um, uh, and you know, hope and in a world that's unlike ours, but feels like perhaps in, within reach within a few generations. And mm-hmm. so like the, I, the chance for me to just kind of like say, Hey, this is everything that Star Trek's meant to me. I hope, I hope I can pass that on to another little kid sitting on their couch with their dad mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> was something that I think maybe intuitively kind of came out in this episode, even when I was doing little scenes like, you know, uh, uh, you know, with, with Gwen and and Zero uh, uh, corresponding and 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 bonding sort of for the first time, you know, I think that was sort of it's always been I think a, a, a major Star Trek ideal was sort of like that out of many one kind of philosophy of just like our our differences are are our strengths and we can fill in each other's weaknesses and mm-hmm. Zero is sort of sort of a, a, analytical and and perhaps. Um, you know, uh, neuroatypical approach to understanding Gwen's grief actually winds up give, helping giving her perspective. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it, it was it, every scene and every line to me felt like an opportunity. And uh, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, I, and I've said this on other podcasts and interviews before is like, writing Star Trek of all the, I've written a lot of stuff over the years, but writing Star Trek for me is felt the most just like breathing because so mm-hmm. much of my own philosophy and my own um, sort of aesthetic was so not just 
uh, informed by it, but almost like the foundation of it. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm glad that I could give back, I guess, because Star Trek's done a lot for me. I remember when I was a young teenager, I had my own woes and troubles, and but I could always come home and I would watch Next Generation, and then they would then Deep Space Nine would be on back to back, and I I was able to watch Deep Space Nine every day and always come home and see how these other characters, you know, kind of were de dealing with their own perhaps outlandish, you know, science fiction problems, but it was always a metaphor for something very real, emotional, mm -hmm. uh, deeply personal, and ultimately true. Um, and that's what I think all great writing does. So I'm, I'm glad I was able to emulate that even just a little bit uh, for you. I, I say this in the most <clears throat> complimentary way that I can. It, uh -oh. When I got the script, <laughs> it was like reading some of the best fan fiction of Star Trek because we've all thought to ourselves, if yeah. I could have the perfect bridge crew, who would it be? And and, and from original oh. series, but you but you're and, and then from next gen and then from uh, DS9. But at the same time, you never can, you know, oh, that'll never happen because obviously they're all in different times and you can't you can't merge it together and you just we're like, you know what? I can do it. And you made the perfect, you made <laughs> yeah. the perfect little <laughs> fanfic moment. Uh, and that's what it felt like to me. It felt like, oh gosh, this is like, you know, chewing the best kind of fan fiction a trick you could ever hope for. Yeah. Um, but, and I mean that as a compliment because no, I know everyone true. watching was just I, like, oh, you know, seeing them yeah, all together on a bridge. There's no question that there was a certain <laughs> element of wish fulfillment and fan fiction. Uh, that, but I think, I, I think the yeah. the the fun part of it, though, is that it was earned within the lore of the universe and that mm -hmm. we, were, we were kind of updating the Kobayashi Maru and we've seen the holodeck can literally summon just about any historical figure just by saying, computer, show me Leonardo da Vinci and he would appear and there'd be some sort of baseline version of it. So it kind of made sense, you know, that that you could apply to that to a training simulator. And mm -hmm. as we saw in the original Wrath of Khan depiction of of the Kobayashi Maru, it wasn't just a bunch of other ensigns that were there filling in the roles. It was literally the the actual crew of the Enterprise doing these trading simulations with you know Savic. Uh, so in our in that way, I think ours is actually a little more practical <laughs> that you can you know because we yeah. got to thinking you know. Um, when you if okay so if if fast forward 100 years if you were told okay how do you select the best bridge crew and how can you adapt this to individual you know um tests or individual characters or whatever or, or uh, that are taking it then of course there would be all these different options and perhaps they would just have logs of all the starfleet personnel and it would just that presumably had either taken the tests or had had some sort of assessment by Starfleet and mm -hmm. um, it made sense to us that, you know, you'd have Scotty, who's arguably the greatest engineer who ever lived. Uh -huh. um, and Odo, I personally think is probably the best uh, security officer we've ever seen in Starfleet. You know, he's no, no, no disrespect to Worf, but I think that Worf <laughs> got a little bit less done than, than Odo. Odo actually like, you know, was like a private eye and would do stakeouts and stuff and bring people in. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and, you know, and, and Uhura, obviously greatest communications officer ever. I, th I, I will say she came out more in the movies than in the TV show, but mm -hmm. even in the TV show, you had little bits like a uh, gamesters of Triskelion, which I even sampled in this episode where she's just like, I don't care where, whether it's allowed or not, I will not do it. And then yeah. that's Ooh, standing that up to these problem. like gods. Yes. Where these like, there's like these alien gods that are basically forced them to play these games. And she's like, hell oh, no. That's a great episode. You know, and that's like, oh. that. that's when I was like, oh, that's what, that's the Uhura I remember. Cause I, I remember her from the movies and I was like, oh, that I, I need to use that. Um, and it just fierce. happened to dovetail perfectly into Odo resigning his commission. So. <laughs> that was so great. <laughs> It was perfect. <sighs> so, Aaron, so, yeah, I, I've got to, I've got to echo everything that has been said before. I, I gave it an A plus. Sorak and I, I didn't realize that Sorak and I both gave this an A plus without hesitation, without speaking. We don't talk about these things; we just go right into it. Um, but we were talking a, a few minutes ago, and I wanted, to, I wanted to touch on it a bit more. The the gateway aspect of this, and and the way you are, it, it's almost as if you are showing children. I mean, obviously this is for adults as well, which is very clear right now. Uh, but when you are presenting Star Trek to children, it's almost as if 
you are trying to present them with the awe and the wonder and the joy that you saw and you see in Star Trek. And if there was one word I would use to describe Prodigy as a whole, I would say wonder. Uh, because it, you're kind of opening their minds and you're saying, see, look, look how cool Star Trek is. Don't you love it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, one is there, of us. One is of there us. like, there, there's got to be this fine line that you are walking yourself as a writer and the writer's room as a whole where you're, you're trying to say, okay, I want this to be for children and I want this to be for adults and kind of how you walk that fine line and, and, and weave that in and out is how does that conversation usually go or what do you prioritize? I think usually when we have these conversations, we prioritize just the story and the mm-hmm. character. Like we start from that. And then if for whatever reason, as we're talking about it, we're like, oh, that might be a little too crunchy, sci- you know, sci-fi, or that might be a little too dark or whatever. Then we like, well, how can, what's, how do we adjust the dial? So it's accessible to everybody, a- adults mm-hmm. and kids, but doesn't necessarily dilute either's experience. Because mm-hmm. I think when you're writing for children or young adults in particular, sometimes there is this assumption that you have to water it down or you have to make it like more infantile or dumb or, or, you know, talk down to them. But the thing I remember from my own childhood and just dealing with my own friends and and relatives who have kids now is like, you know, kids are smart. They're way smarter than you think they are. Uh, You have to give them so much credit. You know, maybe it's just because I grew up, you know, sneaking down and watching on WGN, like all of the R-rated movies that they would play on the Saturday <laughs> afternoon matinee on TV. So Guilty. I got to see, like, you know, Aliens way too early. Mm-hmm. And, um, <laughs> Best movie uh, ever. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, but the, the thing is, like, even if I was a little bit scared or even if I was like a little confused, it didn't turn me off from it. What it instead, it, 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 if I was scared, I would get to the end of the movie and realize I was still alive and I got through it. I'd feel a little stronger for it. Like, oh, uh, mm-hmm. like fear is like anything else uh, that you that that you can overcome if you if you have the resolve or if it's something confusing. I would I found myself staying up at, at, at late at night as a kid, you know, under the covers, like turning the, the idea over in my head, like, how does that make sense? Well, if he went back in time, then this, you know, and until I had figured it out and, you know, and then I understood it. And, and really it was, it was, that's, I think science fiction in particular, but all literature to a certain degree um, is great at that. That's the whole purpose of it is th- thought experiments. It's, it's a, it's sort of popular culture, philosoph- philosophy, that gives you a chance to sort of push yourself outside of your comfort zone and explore who you are by venturing into things that you aren't. Uh, so uh, we never really came to it from a place of like, oh, let's make this dumb thing for babies because it's for babies. And <laughs> it was always, it was always, what's something cool that we want to see that that mean that will mean something to these characters and to the world as it is now. And perhaps to the, the, the legacy of Star Trek uh, as it is now and, and in this time period of Star Trek, you know, which I, I think uh, as some hardcore Trekkies are, are aware, it's, it's like sort of the grace before the fall, at least for a little while, because, mm-hmm. you know, and, and as we've seen in Picard in 2385, you know, there's the Utopia Planitia incident. And, and then so suddenly uh, Star Trek, uh, the, the Federation has to retract its borders and, and becomes very isolationist and stuff. So we're kind of in this period of the golden age before that, where it's like great expansion and, you know, wild experimentation and the sky's the limit and the Dominion War is over. So let's yeah. just go out there and, and throw spaghetti at the wall and try new technology and <laughs> go back to Star Trek season one, where you could suddenly be thrown out at, to the far end of the, the universe and nobody would bat an eye. <laughs> By snap of um, a finger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I feel like when the, when the show first came out, I think that's what, uh, when it was first announced, a lot of people's fear was that, oh, this is going to be Star Trek for babies. Just like you were right. saying, there was a lot of, you know, fear, uh, not even fear, a lot of speculation and, and criticism on, on social media about it. And people were so, the, all the naysayers were just so upset about it at first. And then as soon as the first episode came out, it was like a complete 180. Everyone went, oh, we get it. And then, you know, it just, 
And I feel like the more people watch it, the more they realize it's it's not a kid show. It's it's I would say it's more of a family show. It's for everyone. Right. And that's yeah. what makes it so special. Yeah, I mean, there was a there was a period of time in the late 80s and 90s, I suppose, where you had a lot of like this sort of four quadrant in the that's what it's called in the in the industry, not and not in Star Trek, not the Gamma Delta. <laughs> they call it four quadrant because it's literally for oh, all no. demographics, like male and female, older and younger. One, mm-hmm. two, three, four. Uh, and it's and that's your Jurassic Parks, you know, that's your Ghostbusters, that's your things that are just like it's there's something there for everybody. And mm-hmm. you can literally as a family sit down and watch it and have a shared storytelling experience that mm-hmm. everyone gets something very profound out of. And, uh, you know, whether we always achieve that is a different story, but that's something that myself and the Hageman brothers and many of the other writers on the show have always striven for, because that was the stuff that we loved growing up, that sort of Amblin, Spielbergian, the James Cameron-esque type stories that uh, that come back to you even now, again and again. So that's what we're, uh, that's what we're always aiming for, even if it takes us a little bit to get there. Mm. Yeah, great development. Um, with the character development too, for um, getting backstory on the diviner and the lines mm-hmm. that he had about, you know, recreating the prodigy and, you know, there's no obstacle we can't overcome for we are Thalmacot, is that what is it? Thalmacot, yeah. Thalmacot. Okay. Yeah, um, and then bringing that line back again um, towards the end in prodigy where she's, you know, realizes that the language that she knows and that's her ancestral language is what the program is written in. Very clever, um, gives her more sense of purpose. Also gave a very special meaning to the moment that was exchanged between her and Dow when, uh, when somebody said, it's a good thing we came back to save you, you know? <laughs> and, and they had that, that small exchange, which I thought is a growth in their relationship. It was kind of a moment where they, acknowledge each other and say, okay, we're in this together. And you well, know. she comes to the realization that he actually does care about her. Not, yeah. You know, it wasn't yeah. some even, even if Dal loop. is pretty atrocious at, at uh, learning how to be vulnerable, uh, you know, I think that that's, mm-hmm. that was the first crack well, the first of several cracks, I think that we've yeah. seen slowly sprint splintering mm-hmm. through his, his uh, veneer uh, and learning how to be part of a, a community of mutual trust with his friends and found family. So, so yeah, that, 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 I, that you've picked up on all this stuff that I was hoping <laughs> that would, you, you would. Yeah, so. they, they, they were great. They were great moments. And even the idea of ending it on the Chicote, I thought was extremely clever and left Man. me wanting more. I just, you know, I, I was like, Oh, it's over. It's over. Oh my God. It's over. I can't <laughs> wait till the next one. Um, I have a feeling so, that yeah. you weren't my first crew. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that one, that right at the end. And yeah. even the fact that they're 4,000 light years away, like all of these things that you threw into this episode, it was just layered with so much uh, context. And um, I think it gave a lot for the audience um, to go on. Almost could have, I mean, this could have been a pilot episode. It was just so good. It was so many good things in it uh, um, that I feel like the journey is almost now again, just beginning for them, where I feel like, we did all this to get here so that now we can start another journey. And it's almost the rebirth of the show. It's amazing. Um, Mm -hmm. So, so soon and so early on that you've, you know, you've, you've got us kind of really um, bought in on the characters that you've developed. And so now I'm, I'm in, so what's going, what's, what are, what, what's on the menu for the next episode? You know, that that's what you've created. And I I really thank you for that. Um, And I love your line too, Bonnie. You know about uh, captain assessment, three percent. Yes, the yes, and two percent. Those, those are great. When and you were talking you know, about Dal, I was going to say, well, not to brag, but he did score a two percent on leadership. Yeah, so he's yeah, two percent. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, what's great uh, with all the writers and Aaron, like, of course, you specifically in this episode, you know, as the computer, I feel like I've gotten to have so many comedic moments which i yeah. feel like never really you know I, i'm so blessed to have that because there's something about the timing and just like you know even yeah. from like the very first time i've really had a scene where you know please tell me there are more skate pods on board like there are no more skate pods on board. like just the <laughs> little moments that i've had that are you know yeah. um access denied little things <laughs> that i've gotten to do with the characters 
it's it's shown almost like a sense of humor uh to the moments and i've loved that you know because as the computer you know i don't i'm not really getting to you know use my acting chops so much but it's been so fun to watch and like see it you all edited though. together and and it's you been are. so much fun oh thank you but you know what i mean like it's so fun to like see those little moments happen i, I laughed out loud i was like oh that's funny <laughs> <laughs> i love the little so it's really pause. it's been great is, is it almost indetectable pause that you put after just before you say the last one where it's just like Overall score, point yeah. one percent. Yeah, point yeah. one percent. Yeah, and I remember recording this. Um, uh, the day we recorded it, you know, I did so many different numbers, like attempt number seventy four, attempt number one hundred and thirty two. Like we went through, we just did a a whole bunch of numbers, and I just did them at random half the time because we were like, we don't know what's gonna happen, how many segments are going to happen how many times they're going to like intercept it in so i just i think i went through so many different numbers you know i think i even did one where it was like attempt number uh you know 94 and a half you know like i don't know i did like little things like that um 0. 0.7 you know yeah it was we, fun it was fun I think, I think one of the drafts maybe it was the first draft because i couldn't i couldn't stop myself when i was no. writing this episode <laughs> i i think I, there was probably an extra like five or six minutes that we just couldn't use oh, oh yeah man. different ways he tried like just like a montage of chaos yeah, yeah i remember point, i remember reading that yeah. at one point there was like a uh a, a, a tug of war with tractor beams and he accidentally there... slings the kobayashi maru into the sun at was there point. a dance off i can't re I'm, there was there wasn't a dance off. There was a negotiation scene. Negotiation that, scene where he I'm tried. He, he just like, all right, what's it gonna take? Like a crate of Cardassian bubbly. You know, like you and <laughs> yeah. me, let's make a deal. And then the Klingons just called him a patak and blew him up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, it was a it really was great. like it, I, if this is an hour long episode, it could have easily been. Honestly, mm -hmm. I could have just kept going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just put, apparently, all you need if you tell me just write write bridge scenarios that have no consequences then uh, uh apparently that will <laughs> occupy me uh until the kingdom comes you gotta get a montage and this is a poo -poo. It's like just a huge <laughs> montage of explosions and scenarios it was great it was a lot of fun you know aaron you yeah. also uh initially at the beginning I, I mentioned how you let your nerd flag fly and it wasn't just because of this kind of fantasy scenario that all us star trek fans I've done a million times over guilty we do it we go like i want wharf and uhura and and yep. hoshi you know yeah uh but <laughs> what you also did was you snuck in some things for those of us that go <laughs> yeah you know and there are a couple things i didn't catch i want to give a shout out to our associate producer dr Anne marie siegel uh who's very active on twitter and has a lot of things to say uh she pointed out that you also uh when they were looking for the kobayashi maru and they were kind of switching through there was the paxau resort on talix and yeah. there was oh, yeah. deadwood as well which was uh you know in like fistful of datas yeah, uh, i don't know if there was i don't know if there was more than that but i mean that's pretty impressive to sneak to where people actually have to like hit pause and like yeah. really look closely i don't know if I, there's more I, things you i snuck think in there, there is i think there is the uh i'm blanking on the name the name of it, but it's it's the from Elementary Dear Data. The it, Sherlock Holmes one. Yes, it's called yeah. like Sherlock 4B or something. But if you, mm -hmm. I think it's the first time they show it. Again, you have to pause it for like a fraction of a second, but you wow. can see there is there's a Sherlock there. Wow, uh, that's cool. definitely that. At one point, we even had Dixon Hill in there, but I think just. <laughs> at one point we just had him scrolling through every single one <laughs> and i was like just put it all in you just put them all in but vic we, fontaine we you know yeah yeah we had to cut <laughs> i think vic fontaine's nightclub was in there or something but we had to we had to cut it for time at, at some point yeah. you know there's only so mm. much you could really get out of that other than just fan service but we, we managed to get enough little hints that are just for people that, that stop and look and the other one of course is the the game from the episode the game the yes the cone yeah. game mm -hmm. that was, mentioned uh, at the top i have to give a I have to give a shout out. That was uh, our um, supervising producer, Patrick Krebs, who's also a big Star Trek fan. That was his idea. And I was like, yes, we absolutely should do that. <laughs> I, I think in the in the first draft, I, I, I just had like it was the snake game 
<laughs> but mm. instead the snake game oh, yeah. it, was, it was seti eels <laughs> um mm. and from uh, star trek uh, a wrath of khan but he was like no let's make it the game from tng and i was like that's a better reference than me just referencing the game snake <laughs> yeah because it's immediately <laughs> recognizable mm -hmm. we all see that and we go oh wait i know that one good old wesley mm -hmm. crusher's antics saving the day again yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you one of my favorite moments too um, was the high five between Dell yes! and yes. Spock. <laughs> when Spock puts up the live long and prosper and he just slapped his hand and the look he did. <laughs> that was another priceless moment in this episode. Yeah, yeah, that was that was something I think we found. I can't remember. Oh no, it wasn't the script, but then they we we had to finesse it just right in the boards. Because I think Dal was making a genuine, like he, he obviously had never seen the <laughs> prosper gesture. So he just kind of assumed he was, it was like a handshake or something, you know? Um, By the and, way, let it be known that is called a sci five. A sci five. Oh, oh, that's, oh I love that. okay. You okay. That. You just did that, Ryan. <laughs> uh, no, so, was, yeah, that was. That was that and that was that's kind of the fun in animation too is like you you have a few bites of the apple just to find little mo moments and nuances that you can kind of color in the lines and make mm -hmm. every everything just a little bit more humanistic and a little more real or just like a fun little nod of, or a reaction from a character in the background maybe you weren't paying attention to the first two around you know it's it's uh it's a wonderful medium to play in but i'm i'm so glad that everybody's picking up on these little things that we managed to drop in mm -hmm. Well, nice. actually, speaking of which, can I just point out uh, that everybody, not just us, but everybody is really loving this. Uh, mm -hmm. I want to show you some of the reactions from the uh, Lower Decks uh, Facebook group that we have here. Just very quickly, so you could take. Yeah, a this quick is look. this was, this episode was sort of a shot across the bow at Lower Decks, I guess. <laughs> oh, sorry, did I see Lower Decks? I meant Prodigy. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I don't know why you would need to see the the Lower Deck stuff. Sorry. No, I, I thought Prodigy. maybe the Lower Decks people are like they're encroaching on our turf. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> the aforementioned Anne Marie Siegel was very excited and had a lot of things to say wow. uh, here. All great things. The game she caught. Uh, Jenna Stevens says, "Oh my God, that episode was so cool." Well done. So many familiar friends. Uh, mm -hmm. Levi Tinker. By the way, Levi Tinker here is the general manager of uh, Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood. Oh, really a, a wonderful guy. Huge Star Trek fan. He uh, came in the clutch very much so when uh, Aaron Eisenberg passed away and, and we needed a place for a, uh, you know, for a gathering for a funeral. And he hooked that up. He's just a wonderful wow. human. Uh, Mark says, ooh, great cameos. Hal Bjorn <laughs> says, love this episode. Oh my God, Spock, Odo, Crusher, and Uhura, I'm dying. Well, just wait till you see Scotty. But Oh, there it is. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> another mystery. There's Le Levi saying more great things. Um, mm. That's an all new performance by Gates. I'm assuming that is correct. Yes. Yeah, she even improvised a couple of the lines there. Amazing. I believe. She says the 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 um, condition of your stubbornness should belongs in a medical textbook. That was uh, <laughs> I like that it's line. So well, also, uh, Melissa Longo, who, by the way, is the widow of Aaron Eisenberg. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's Aaron Eisenberg's birthday, by the way. It's so everybody raise a day. glass yes. of root yeah. beer. We'll be celebrating that a little later. She says it's a great episode. And she said uh, privately that she really loved this episode as well. Jim Westbrook loved it. Adam David wow. uh, made a mess. He said, my brain melted a bit through my brain or my ears. Uh, loved it. Dow Kobayashi Maguru, love it. Anyway, lots and lots wow. and lots of love. Wow. wow. In it's, the uh, Prodigy group. Sorry. <laughs> this, this episode was so hard to make. And there were so many instances where I was in the thick of it and just trying to figure out how I was going to do it. And I was like, am I making the worst episode of Star Trek ever? <laughs> so it is very <laughs> surreal to be sitting here and having people say the opposite because it was, you know, you convince yourself in, your, in those long dark nights of the soul that, you know, you're just trying to make the best of a bad situation. Like, oh, I've, I've I've flown through close, too close to the sun. What have I done? <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm glad that the people are being so forgiving and, and uh, very, very kind about it. So thank you, everybody. 
it's been yeah you've you, you just set a high bar and really set the show off on a great trajectory um I, I i love it and now i can see why bonnie you were so excited about what was about to happen and you couldn't reveal it and we're just boiling over oh i've been sitting on this for so long everyone's like <laughs> oh because in every interview I do, you know, everyone's like, oh, we're so excited that, you know, Chicote has been announced. You know, I wonder if there's any other cameos. And I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. <laughs> just it, it hurt. It hurt so hard. Um, and, you know, after reading the script of this episode, you know, I was just so excited for it as a Star Trek fan that, you know, I was just I, I was just wait. I couldn't wait for people to watch it and to see their reaction to it. So it's been so fun. You know, I've been Aaron. I know you're your notifications are going crazy but i've i've been doing the same thing like searching all the hashtags and like you know liking every tweet i can it's been so much fun seeing everyone's mind being blown uh you know mm -hmm. by this episode and also what a yeah. great return just like they were saying it's such a great return you know because the first five episodes really raised the bar um you know prodigy it's you know people are just like they couldn't believe there was a break they wanted more right away yeah. and you know for them to have to wait this long and for it to come back on such a high note i think really yeah. um really says something about the show you know like so many people were just so excited for this episode and once they watched it they were not disappointed so mm. kudos yeah. to, to you I, and the like all the writers i mean yeah I, it was, and i feel like every episode just keeps raising the bar um you know knowing what's to come i just can't wait for everyone to watch what's to come like it's just ah! yeah, i i want to make it very clear <laughs> yes i did a lot of work on this episode just in terms of the story but it was not me alone by mm. any means like all the everyone from the actors the storyboard artists our editors our, our effects people our directors our executive producers everybody was just like all hands on deck we knew from the get-go this was going to be a very hard episode mm. to make Ambitious. and we all said yes but to quote jfk we do these things not because they are easy but because <laughs> they are hard uh so we, we all came together <laughs> and really like committed to it even when it was hard even when mm. it would seem like it was not working or it was going to be too much trouble they 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 held held tight and they gave me the latitude to to you know, try to make it the best that I could, and they and I empowered them to do their job to the best of ability, and everybody just worked really, really hard on this. And I want to thank all of them for for their hard work mm -hmm. because yeah. it literally couldn't be made without it. So thank mm -hmm. I, I I appreciate all of this praise, but I I want to also deflect uh, uh, most, if not all of it, also to the Star Trek Prodigy crew. Who, mm -hmm. who managed to pull this episode off so because they they're they truly are yeah. miracle workers in the most scotty of senses like you have no idea what's going on behind the scenes uh to make these uh incredible episodes basically out of like bubble gums and toothpicks <laughs> uh you know <laughs> just to, but to make it seem like cinema quality um so i'm deeply appreciative of them and everybody yeah so. yeah your team <laughs> conquered well your own personal Kobayashi Maru. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, you're right. I believe you all passed. Yeah. <laughs> you all passed. Make it official. You all Bonnie. passed. You I, I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> you have passed the Kobayashi Maru. Oh, my God. I just died. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? <laughs> what have you done? <laughs> Mm. Red alert. No, the, everybody no, did it, bring their A game. You could see that the animation was fantastic. Uh, um, just the, the whole story f flowed so well. The, and all mm. the actors, I mean, just hit the right notes. I felt the sensitive, uh, the sensitivity in the moments. Um, and you know, the humor. Prodigy, Prodigy was saying, yeah. When he, I the love humor, that they the, bring so much humor yeah. into it. So the kids, you know, are also getting that you know just like when you cut to the bridge and it's completely empty and they're all huddled behind the uh, console it, it's just so funny just little almost like vaudevillian yeah. bits that yeah. uh keep <laughs> both the adults and the kids laughing you know it's it's yeah. like a constant well i grew up uh watching charlie chaplin because i'm okay. this is a weird fact that it has nothing to do with anything but i am just <laughs> you're not like... that old man. you're not that old <laughs> are you really no. really are you really? Yeah, I, I, uh, Charlie Chaplin is my great, 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 great uncle. 
Uh, so oh, wow. that's I, incredible. I have always felt you can kind of see it a little bit in the face. Not really. Uh, but but I've always kind of glom because of that, just maybe it's just more force of habit from my family kind of drilling mm. that into me. I've always really had a deep appreciation of like physical comedy and and, you know, Chaplin in particular had this gift of taking, you know, an ordinary scene and making it extraordinary mm -hmm. just by what, you know, sort mm -hmm. of refashioning and repurposing what you think are uh, the normal circumstances, you know, a cane and keeping the moment sword. real. Yeah. And yes. keeping the moment real and actually like keeping heart to it. Yeah. yeah. You know, for, for every instance where, you know, he, he kicked a Keystone cop in, in the butt or whatever, he also <laughs> would, would hold out a flower to a blind homeless woman or adopt mm -hmm. a, young, a, a small orphan boy and keep him out of trouble and, mm -hmm. and, you know, make them happy by dancing with little potatoes on forks, you know, and that, that, that sort of humanism, I think is, uh, is a direct correlation one-to-one -one with Star Trek of like the, it's, it's not just the, the, the crazy science fiction that you come to Star Trek for. It's for those human moments, uh, mm -hmm. um, even when you're dealing with characters that are not human. So uh mm -hmm. that's uh, i i'm uh i'm glad that that uh, i got to get a little slapstick in this as well because you know we, we're after the intensity of some of the previous episodes we wanted to have a little bit of that. Uh, oh. but still couldn't help ourselves and make people uh feel emotions as well in this episode <laughs> you know we only have a, a few minutes left here and aaron you've been extremely generous with, with your time we really appreciate that i do want to point out uh, what Ciroc, I want to touch on a little bit more, what Ciroc mentioned, the animation quality. And, you know, we got to give them their kudos, especially right here. Oh. This almost looked like a freaking picture. How did they do that so well? It's gorgeous. It's amazing. And I know every Star Trek fan paused it right here like I did. Uh, so that was just mind-blowingly good and i'm sure you know aaron and and you as well bonnie when you see it go from page to screen like that mm. it's got to be a really nice feeling yeah and yes oh go ahead aaron i was just like well it's just it's just a testament to our artists is what mm -hmm. i was going to say it's like and that we use it's kind of fun because in animation to to achieve some of those cool effects sometimes we'll we will have the actual cgi models from the original Star Trek series that they just had in the archives that we were able to import in. Or other times we, we borrow from very old cinema techniques and we'll create actual matte paintings to make it seem like you are in this fantastical reality or there's a, a thing that would be really hard to build. But if you have an artist paint it and it looks photorealistic, it looks cool. Mm. So, yeah. So I think that's how, one of those two techniques is how they must have done that. <laughs> I feel uh, like also, every episode we just pause it and you just want to frame art yeah. on your wall of, of every episode I've seen. Um, I've just been blown away. I mean, just the opening credits is so iconic and gorgeous. Uh, it, it's frustrating that we don't have an art book yet, but I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's on the way. It, I'm sure it's, there's more there merch. are talks. Don't worry. There's I, really I'm, awesome. Cause I just want one so bad for myself. I'll make my own if I have to, I'm just going to start printing out, yeah. you know, freeze frames <laughs> for my phone. If I have to, <laughs> for a lot of this stuff, I think it's just a matter of, of when not if of it, course you know, of course you just have to get yeah. the right people on board and and putting mm -hmm. together even an art book you have to find an editor who will collect all that stuff and get the interviews and stuff but it's i i think that they're looking into it so it's coming and and i think having been um who is an artist mm -hmm. as well uh, you know like overseeing the direction a lot of the time uh m makes that art that much more stunning i feel like because he he comes from an artist background i think it actually um what's the word amplifies how mm -hmm. amazing yeah. this art is yeah because he studied fine arts uh mm -hmm. you know and, and obviously he's done a lot of incredible work over the years you know he was if you're not familiar ben was responsible for the old the the um deathly hallows uh animated sequence in harry potter mm -hmm. like that very no. stylized kind of surreal sequence he directed that um and i remember when he when he first came on board our show you know, he was just like, he was just like, oh, I was just playing around and I thought I wanted to see what Tarzamar is like. And he brought in, like, he wheeled in what looked to me like a gorgeous, like museum quality painting uh, of, of Tars Lamora. And I was like, that's your rough draft. <laughs> but he's such an artist through and through, yeah. Ben. And he sees mm -hmm. everything through that lens of how can we celebrate while also amplify um, and, you know, finding that sliding scale. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very, 
very grateful we have him on our team as well. I feel like that's why the, like, you know, just kudos to the whole animation and, and the artists that work on this. Cause yeah, the, it's like, yeah, you watch it and it's like, this is cinema worthy animation mm -hmm. by far, you know, like I could it's, see this on a big screen. That is only by the sheer sweat, blood, and tears of our artists. I will oh, I, I guarantee you, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, it's because they care and they are mm -hmm. going the extra mile. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we all have to be very, very grateful to them. Mm -hmm. um, now, speaking of beautiful imagery, I do also want to point out. Thank you, our buddy oh. uh, Don <laughs> Crandall uh, sent this in to anybody that don't know doesn't know what the game ah, reference the is. Game. <laughs> there it is. There's the game reference. Yes. He also oh, uh, he noticed no. a lot of the Easter eggs as well, pointed a lot of them out. He also mentioned that he saw the Gamma Quadrant on the star chart and wonders slash surmises mm. if we may see the Dominion or Weiyun number 78 floating around in space. So that's always a possibility. Um, <laughs> there's just so much in here, and I wish we had more time to cover it all. Uh, I do want to really quickly say please. that the uh, uh, Dow's performance was really great in this. I thought it covered Always. the full spectrum of emotions in, in this episode. You know, the confidence of uh, of kind of the arrogance of trying to beat the simulation, but also mm -hmm. the vulnerability in the moment with Spock when, you know, Spock says, you know, you, you have to be anything less than perfect, you know, is unacceptable, essentially. And mm -hmm. he's he has that vulnerability where he's like, I'm not perfect and I'm not you know what you think I am you know I, I, I'm not really the person but I thought those kinds of moments of ups and downs really makes a multi-dimensional mm -hmm. uh and you know even with Prodigy's character multi-dimensional I like the fact that they're layered and they're just not stuck in one kind of lane of you know arrogance or flippidness or or just uh always resisting there's kind of a back and forth of just this just the multi dimension so you get layers of, of of who these people are and mm -hmm. i think it really reflects in the writing so yeah i'm i'm very interested to see where we go from here that you have just like really um put the bait out there and i'm sure a lot of us are going to be biting on it now oh, yeah. so if you didn't already bite you, it, this is the time to bite <laughs> wow well that's that's quite an endorsement thank you yeah. mm -hmm. right, great well I do want to give uh, some time very quickly. We want to give a very special thanks to Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin. Uh, Arukin. So Rock's like, you're going to make me do it in front of Aaron. <laughs> and, uh, Yvette Blackman, Tom, Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy, Eve England out in Wales, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Titus Muller, Tim Baum, John Mann, Darlena Marie Rex, a. Wood, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Dr. Susan oh, yeah. B. Gruner, Joe Balserati, and Tierney C. Diekman. See, Muhammad, people's eyes light up when they hear your name. I, <laughs> I had so much fun geeking out with Muhammad the other day. That, that was fun. Awesome. That awesome. <laughs> and, right. and so was Anne-Marie and Katie. They were all wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Aaron, uh, for, for this contribution to the whole Star Trek uh, family. Uh, we want to continue the great work this show looks like it's got a long way to go and you are um definitely you know, piquing all of our interests and got us strapped in for the ride so thank you man for for joining us today and and, and just giving us this gift well very very happy to be here uh you know i hope i hope uh we earn your and keep your trust you know because we really do care about the franchise and uh you know and talking about uh the, the yeah. uh language being more than just translation but interpretation you know i think star trek is very much more than just the letter of the law of getting all of the the canon details this or that or whatever but it really is about trying to embrace the spirit and more than anything yeah. else i feel like Star Trek Prodigy tries to embrace the spirit of Trek, and I hope mm. that, that people continue to see that in our show. Absolutely. So, thank you so much yeah. for having me. I appreciate this time chatting. Aaron, awesome. you're the best. Thank you so much for your time. Get some rest. Um, also, everybody at home, it is Aaron Eisenberg's birthday, so raise a glass of root beer or slug juice or something, and everybody toast to him. Remember his laughter. Remember his great energy and have a great day. 
Um, Bonnie, thank you very much. Of course, as usual, you are a shiny beacon and you've got the best hair in podcasting. Thank you, darling. <laughs> uh, I'm a delight, let me tell you. Oh, uh, thank you. No, thank you so much for having me. And also, uh, I just love coming on and geeking out with you guys. And, you know, just like Aaron was saying, I think everyone who works on the show, no matter how small, from the writers to the animators to the, you know, the people behind the scenes working on everything from the storyboards and the, the cast, we all are doing this from a place of love. I feel like all of us in some way or another love Star Trek just from interacting with everyone, um, you know, behind the scenes right. and the love for it, sh I think, shines through. And so thank you for letting mm -hmm. me come on here and love it with you because it gives me an outlet so i'm not just sitting at home going like i need to talk about this with somebody <laughs> that's how we feel too right sarag we just want to talk yeah. about and basketball but anyway um yeah of course thank you very much uh really appreciate it everybody at home check out prodigy watch it 50 times buy the merchandise <laughs> i think i saw a sneak i think i saw maybe the prodigy writing on aaron's shirt i'm not sure i saw oh, like yes. a print yep this i did catch merch. It. you can't buy this one this is crew gear. Oh. But there's other oh, shirts yeah. you can buy you can buy star trek i have prodigy one shirts on, yes on on star right. trek.com I'm wearing one. I'm I'm wearing a cat one right now. A Star Trek Whoa. cat. <laughs> so um, nice. not Prodigy per se, but I'm representing. That's okay. Get your Prodigy stuff. Star Trek.com, <laughs> everybody. And uh, well, I guess we'll see you next time. Until then, always remember the seventh rule.